So I think it's time for local communities, county governments, local governments to be much more actively involved because they're the ones who are impacted when you see these mega fires that burn down, you know, tens of thousands of homes and hundreds of lives are lost. It's not some bureaucrat in the interior department in Washington, D.C. who suffers. that has to breathe this air or lose a loved one. It's people in California. So I think what we need to do is allow local governments to, and local private landowners as well to have a lot more say about rapidly removing this excess fuels. Welcome to California Insider. My guest today is Lawrence McQuillan. He's a senior fellow and director of the Center on Entrepreneurial Innovation at the Independent Institute. He received his PhD in economics, served as chief economist at the Illinois Policy Institute, and is also Director of Business and Economic Studies at the Pacific Research Institute. Today, he discusses his perspective into California's wildfire crisis, his extensive research into forest fires details, why we are seeing an increase in wildfires, and what precautions we can take to prevent them. Lawrence, it's great to have you on. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, talk to you. You guys have done extensive research on wildfires here in California. Uh, can you tell us what's going on with the wildfires? Every year we have more and more. Every year as, as it goes on, we are having more uh, news about them and they're, they're getting bigger and they're affecting more people. Can you tell us what's happening? Well, I think unfortunately what we're seeing today is we're living with the legacy of 100 years of government mismanagement of California forest land. So just to kind of step back and give you a brief overview, about 60% of California's forest land is owned either by the state or federal government. And for 100 years, the governments had, have had a policy of rapid suppression of fires. So putting out fires very quickly and as a result, uh, what we've seen is a buildup for 100 years of excessive fuels. So this is, you know, dead trees, down limbs, thick brush, heavy vegetation that should have either been thinned or allowed to burn either naturally or through prescribed burns. So what we've seen now in the last 10 years, I think, is just the legacy of this policy of putting out um, fires quickly or not allowing fires to do what naturally fire does, which is clear out the undergrowth and rejuvenate uh, forest land. So just to kind of put this in perspective in terms of numbers, in the 1800s, California had about 50 trees per acre. And today, California has upwards of 500 trees per acre. So we've seen an explosion of trees and vegetation. A lot of these trees are very weak because they're not getting the water, the nutrients, the sunlight that they need to be healthy. So they're very susceptible to disease and overcrowding. Um, there's 150 million dead trees in California. All of this is fuel and it just takes, you know, a spark as we've seen recently, um, lightning, for example, which caused this, an, recent round of fires to set all of this off. It's a tinderbox just waiting to explode. And unfortunately, that's what we've seen in California in recent years. And how do you know that the fuel is, if, if we were to take out the fuel, we would be able to uh, lower the, num the amount of the fires or the impact? Well, we have actually really good examples of that. For example, you know, there was the campfire that burned essentially all of Paradise, California down uh, to the ground. 90% of all the structures in Paradise were destroyed. Um, but just outside of Paradise, there's an area called um, Paradise Lake that where they did treatments, and that's what thinning is called when you remove the underbrush, excessive growth, that's called a treatment. They did three treatments of this Paradise Lake area over five years and as a result that area was largely spared any damage from the campfire that destroyed the town of paradise so it shows you that if you go ahead and do this work 
um, you can have a huge impact in terms of reducing your risk to wildfires. And this work is backbreaking. I mean, it's tedious, it's slow, um, it's very difficult work, but if you do it and remove the excess of growth around areas, especially population areas, you can really have a huge impact on reducing your wildfire risk. There's another example recently, the hog fire outside of Susanville, where they had done um, much treatment earlier. And rather than that exploding into a mega fire, it was a 10,000 acre fire that was quickly extinguished. So again, if you do your work and, and try to do the prevention work early on, you can have a huge impact later on. And does this work adversely affect the environment? Well, um, I mean, that, that's what a lot of the environmental groups would want to let you believe is that you can't tamper with nature. You want to preserve it in its natural state. But you have to remember fire is mother nature's way of controlling excessive growth in forest land. Um, it rejuvenate, you know, it removes the undergrowth, it rejuvenates the, the forest, it allows for more light to get in. Um, it opens up seed, seeds that turn into seedlings and future trees. So it, it is a healthy, it's actually a healthy way of managing forests. Um, so it doesn't have to be destructive. I mean, what we're not, we're not talking about clear cutting the entire side of a mountain, for example. Um, what we're talking about is much more surgical. It's a precise approach where you go in, you remove the dead trees, you do what's called salvage logging. So you can take out some of the, the timber that's in there and use it for beneficial purposes and remove the undergrowth, the excessive vegetation, which has less value obviously to timber companies, but they can still make products out of it, chipboard and other things like that. So, um, so my recommendation would be to approach this with great urgency because we're decades behind the curve now. This has been going on for a hundred years. We're way behind where we need to be. So we need urgency. I would allow counties to do this work in terms of setting up contracts with private companies to go in and remove surgically the, the excess fuels in these areas. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about how that might be done. But, um, but I think that local communities in California have allowed the federal government, the state government, to have too much say about how this land is managed. And that, let's face it, they've just been poor stewards of the land and allowed this fuel to accumulate. So I think it's time for local communities, county governments, local governments to be much more actively involved because they're the ones who are impacted when you see these mega fires that burn down, you know, tens of thousands of homes and hundreds of lives are lost. It's not some bureaucrat in the interior department in Washington DC who suffers, that has to breathe this air or lose a loved one. It's people in California. So I think what we need to do is allow local governments to, and local private landowners as well to have a lot more say about rapidly removing this excess fuels. Do you think it's going to happen based on what you see, or do you think it's going to be a while before that kind of political change happens? I think there's a reason to be optimistic because, um, you know, this is like the third or fourth year now where we've had this explosion of mega fires. And, um, and I think there is a, just a lot more recognition by the public that everybody's life is basically at risk now. Um, these, these aren't contained to some remote area anymore because over time, you know, we have 40 million people living in California. Over time, more and more people have decided to build homes and communities in areas that are pressing up against what used to be remote wildland. So this is called the wildland urban interface. Now um, about 4.4 million homes in California are in this interface area around the state. So they're much more at risk. And so there's, I think a lot higher uh, level of awareness of what the problem is and how it actually threatens you and your community than there used to be. So, um, so we have seen more movement at the state level. I mean, not nearly what I wanna see, but there has been. The federal government has still been very slow 
to do anything in California. So that really discourages me because 57% of all forest land in California is owned by the federal government. I think there has to be a lot more urgency on the part of the federal government and the state government to do something. I mean, my recommendation would be to delegate the authority to county governments to, to um, contract with private companies to go in there and do the work. And there, I think there'd be a much greater urgency if county governments had that authority. Uh, let's, I mean, if you think about it, every state park forest land and every national forest land is in a county somewhere in California. I mean, there's 58 counties in California. So I, I would like to see the state government and the federal government delegate the authority to county governments, say, hey, you get this work done. You set up the specs, specs you tell what the companies what needs to be done, you oversee it, um, but you can then set up these contracts. They go in, they do the work. Um, the counties would oversee, make sure the contract is fulfilled, that they're not removing what they're not supposed to be removing, um, but they're doing their job. And I think you'd see this happen much quicker. So I think there is a reason to be optimistic just because the crisis has gotten to the point where it can no longer be avoided or ignored. Um, and, and now I think we're starting to see a lot more urgency. So, uh, Lawrence, you mentioned there is 57 percent is federal uh, owned, federally owned land. And how about the rest of it? How's the rest managed? Well, 3 percent. 3% is owned by the state of California, forest land, and then 40% is owned by private citizens, uh, land trusts, uh, Native Americans. But keep in mind that 40% is essentially an extension of the state government because there's so many rules and regulations that govern how private landowners can maintain their land. They're not really free to do the thinning on their own land that we think they might be or should be. So for example, if they want to do a significant thinning project on their land, they have to apply for a permit from the state of California that can take weeks or months to get this permit. And then on top of that, um, for example, if you want to do a prescribed burn, a controlled burn on your property, um, you might have the permit for that, but you might not be able to use the permit because uh, the state of California has these regional air quality districts that determine when it's okay to do burns and when it's not. And as a result, you can have a permit for, for years and never be able to use it just because the regional air quality districts won't let you do the burn. And keep in mind that you know prescribed burn is a low intensity fire that prevents mega fires from starting. So in my opinion and estimation, it'd be far better to do a lot of these small burns rather than not do them and then allow a mega fire to develop. That's far worse for the air quality, for pollution, for people's health than doing these smaller controlled burns would be. Is there any data on that in terms of how much pollution do these uh, mega fires create compared to these small prescribed? There, there are, yeah. There's several studies that have been done and, and we mentioned them in, in the report that you mentioned. Up, up front in the interview that um, that show that prescribed burns have uh, far less air pollution effects than uncontrolled wildfires. So the worst thing you want to do is allow this to get to the point where you have a, a, a situation like we've had this year, um, where you have what 1.6 million acres of uncontrolled wildfires burning. Um, that's far worse than doing you know controlled burns throughout the year that are done by you know professionals scientists there's companies that specialize in this type of work so it's not just you're just not lighting fires and walking away i mean they're very controlled they set up you know fuel breaks around them and um, they monitor them very closely obviously um, so you, you have to do this correctly you have to have professionals do this but when it's done right it's not only the cheapest way to do it but also you prevent then something that's far worse from happening in uncontrolled wildfire. Now, what do you recommend the homeowners to do? You had some specific recommendations for homeowners to, mm -hmm. to, to uh, lower the risks for them. What do you recommend right. them to do? Um, well, the first thing I would recommend is that homeowners contact their homeowners insurance company and ask them, do they provide a discount 
for doing um, preventive work around their home. I mean, I think that would be a, a major benefit if insurance companies recognize that um, we'll give you a discount on your premiums if you go ahead and do X, Y, and Z to harden your home. It's called home hardening. So some of the things you could do, and people are doing this around California, and, and it has paid off, um, is um, uh, wild uh, fire res resilient or retardant uh, roofing, siding, um, gutter guards. For example, most homes that burn in wildfires are never directly in contact with flames. So they burn down because embers flies, in some cases, miles away from the source of the fire, land on roofs or land in gut gutters and start the home on fire. So um, one thing you could do is install gutter guards, which keep embers out of your gutters or also uh, fire resilient uh, roofing has that same effect. Um, there's siding that's fire resilient. Um, if you're building a new home, you can insist that it uses material that is fire resistant. Or, and there's some home design, designers now, manufacturers that won't build homes in California of wood anymore. Um, they, they consider it like immoral basically to do that because it's such a risk. Another thing that you can do obviously is create um, kind of a safe space around your home. So clear back vegetation. I mean, every property is different in terms of how much you can clear in terms of your property line. But you know, try to clear back at least 10 feet if you can, 30 feet even better from back from your home and keep that kind of a defensible space around your home. Um, another thing that is being more uh, commonly adopted now in California and elsewhere is called um, external sprinklers. So we all know about the internal sprinklers for fire um, prevention and, and uh, control, but now people are putting sprinklers on the outside of their home that would so is it on the down, roof? Yeah, but yeah, that wets, wets down the roof or the sides of the home or the or the surrounding landscape. And um, so that can not only, you know, prevent an ember, for example, from catching the home on fire, but it also has been shown that it kind of creates a high humidity like bubble effect where it can actually push a fire away from your property because of the humidity effect that it creates around your home. Um, some of these are do it yourself. They're very reasonable, inexpensive. They, you know, they connect to your garden hose basically. Um, and some can be incredibly expensive. There was a home in Portola Valley near San Francisco that just installed one on an estate for $75,000. So, uh, you know, most people aren't going to be able to afford a, a sophisticated system like that. I mean, it has, has its own pump, its own uh, generator, its own, um, you know, external sprinklers that are attached to the home. So it's very sp sophisticated, but, um, but there are do-it-yourself packages that you can get. In, and it has been shown, for example, there was a, a famous case in Minnesota the Ham Lake fire. This was like in the mid 2000s. And um, they had started a pilot project there where they installed external sprinklers on 188 homes in, in the area. And there was a massive fire that um, devoured the area. But of these 188 homes that had these external sprinklers, all but one survived intact without any damage. So I think there is evidence that if you do like small uh, steps like this, you can kind of create a bubble around your home and, and protect a safe your place home and, yeah. around your home. Um, but it takes you know effort, it takes time, and sometimes in case in some cases it takes money. Um, but check with your homeowner's insurance company; they might actually offer a, a discount for doing this type of upgrades. Interesting. Now you had some specific recommendations for the firefighters as well. Uh, how are the firefighters doing in, in, in yeah, the case of um, these fires? Yeah, our recommendations can kind of be divided into like three groups. I mean, one would be prevention, and that's kind of what we've talked about already. You know, the thinning, the treatments, um, the home hardening, that sort of thing. The other would be early detection, so that when a fire starts, you know about it quickly. And so, for example, that includes something, things like um, cameras 
uh, infrared cameras that can detect fires night or day. Um, California has really beefed up its camera system and the cameras are increasingly connected to a network where they can send back information in real time and alert um, commanders when a fire starts and allows them to get their crews position and their machinery position out in front of it. So that's another excellent um, early detection device that California has thankfully invested some significant money in in recent years, um, last year and a half to two years. Um, another system for early detection is um, uh, drones or satellite or uh, aircraft that are equipped with um, cameras that can detect uh, fires in remote locations. There's some satellites that are positioned that have special cameras on them that can detect uh, fires very early on. There was one that uh, uh, they spotted a fire in Alaska very quickly and put it out. Um, this was a couple years ago using this satellite system. So again, it's, it's, it gives you a much broader view than what a camera would. Cameras can, can detect fires about 20 to 40 miles away, but these satellites can view an entire state, for example, at one time. And they do, you know, they'll, they'll take a picture of it like every five minutes. So they're constantly updating the imagery. So that's another system. And again, that information is usually fed um, back to the ground. So they get as up-to-date information as they can to relay to um, commanders on the ground to position their crews and their equipment. Um, so that's kind of the early detection. There's a lot of technology that's being worked on and perfected and developed right now around the world, Asia, um, South America, and the United States are kind of, Australia is another area where they're doing a lot of R&D in this area. And then the third area would be uh, rapid suppression, if that's the best approach. Now, the, the best approach actually might be to let the fire burn. If it's a low intensity fire in a very remote area, the best thing might be to let this burn as mother nature would have done um, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, but if, if it is going to threaten the community and you want to put it out quickly, so there's other investments that have taken place recently in California. So, for example, the state of California purchased 12 Firehawk helicopters, which can dump uh, about a thousand gallons of water at a time. But the key innovation of this one is that it also can fly at night the old Huey helicopters that Cal Fire had couldn't fly at night. And often nighttime is the best time to fight a fire because it's, um, you know, the temperatures drop, wind drops, humidity goes up. So it really allows the crews to kind of get ahead of the fire. Um, so these helicopters, they're not cheap. They're $25 million a piece to buy the helicopter and train the pilot. But it gives you a much, you know, 24 seven capability to fight the fire. So this is the, the state of California bought 12 of these. Um, and another um, innovation, there's not many of these around. The, the one that's used the most is in Colorado. A private company has it. It's called a super tanker, but um, it can drop about 20 times the amount of uh, either water or, or retardant on an area than a typical um, tanker plane can. So it's called a super tanker because it can hold so much water at one time. Um, California probably could use more of these because, for example, this one in, Cal in Colorado is often booked up because it's being deployed in other parts of the country. So it's hard to get access to it. We did have access to it at one point. Um, I believe it was for the campfire in Paradise, but um, but it, but there's so much demand for it that. Um, it's often not available. So it might be good if California invested in um, something like that. And so that's on the grand scale. On a smaller scale is um, robotic fire crews where you can hire uh, or you can buy this machinery that can go into very dangerous situations like a burning home, for example, that you wouldn't want to send a, a, a fire a fighter in to, to check out because it would risk his life. So you can send in these little robotic um, 
things that they also have um, you know they have cameras on so on them attached to them so that the operator can see what what is in the area um, and they can shoot out a, a large quantity of water too if necessary so that's another um, recent um, innovation thermite is called um, this robot so um, so there's all sorts of tech being developed around the world that is geared towards fighting these fires around the world. So I think, um, again, I think that's another reason to be optimistic is that we're seeing a lot more private sector response to these fires and a lot more technology now being developed. And the state has enough funding to invest in these, uh, in, in these uh, equipment and technologies? They better, um, or, or somebody else better, um, because I, I don't think this is going to go away. I think we're just going to continue to see more of this, because as I mentioned, I mean, we're decades behind the curve in terms of fighting these things, we, you know, in terms of doing the prevention work, the thinning, and, and also having the equipment to do the rapid suppression if need be. Um, so, um, yeah, we, got, we have to come up with the money. I mean, right now we're, we're spending... Cal Fire, which is the primary um, firefighting agency in California, has a $2 billion budget annually. But unfortunately, what we've seen in recent years is because the fires have been so horrific and these mega fires that this budget is eaten through very quickly. Sometimes you, a few months into the year, the money's already gone. So they appropriate more money for suppression. But as a result, there's no money left over for prevention. So, and then if the prevention's work isn't being done, that sets up another cycle, even worse fires in the future. So we're kind of locked in this vicious cycle of not having the funds to do prevention. Prevention's not done, so the fires in the future are worse, which eats up the prevention money even quicker um, because it's being diverted to suppression and putting out these fires. So, so what we're going to have to do is make sure that there's sufficient funding um, at some point to do this thinning. Although, if you give the contracts to private companies and say, you can profit from this, you know, use the wood that you salvage however you want in order to profit from it, <clears throat> maybe you won't have to then invest so much of taxpayer money into this. Because the private, in the past, that's how it used to work. I mean, private logging companies built the roads back into the woods. Um, they did the, the logging. They um, reduced the same time they're doing the logging, of course, they're reducing the risk of fire. And um, so there's a win-win, win for them, win for the public. And, and the roads were being maintained so that you, if a fire did start, you could go back and access um, those points. Today, these four, these roads don't exist anymore for the most part. They're, they've been overgrown by vegetation, so you can't get back into a lot of these regions anymore. And that's why these fires just explode um, because you, it's so difficult to fight them once they start. So I think the, the older model of giving uh, logging companies more access, but again, letting the counties dictate what the specs are and say, this is what you can remove, this is what you can't remove, don't take out things that we don't want to be removed. This is what we need done. Um, and, and allowing them to do it, I think, and profit from what they can profit from, I think is, would be a good model to pursue this with. Well, with that, thank you. Thank you.